Hello, everybody. Thank you once again for being here. So this is a research, innovation, and commercialization project that is connecting stakeholders across the research innovation value chain across Ghana. And so this is actually done in partnership with Visa and UK. And so this is a virtual session of the capacity building phase of this project. And so today we have Joanna Finn Will Stipsy with us. And she is a criminal prosecutor. She earned her degree from the University of Ghana, Ligon. And then she's actively an administrator of the NGO Rich for Recovery Ghana. She has spent six years of her life as a banker. And she also serves as a lecturer at the University of Business and Integrated Development Studies in Boa. She's currently the state attorney of, she's a state attorney at the Upper, Upper West Regional Office of the attorney, attorney General. And so I'll hand it over to her as she takes, she walks us through how to protect your intellectual property. Madam Joanna, please, if you are here, over to you. Thank you. Hi, Joanna, can you hear me, please? Hi, Joanna, you can start now. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. So I, like you heard earlier, my name is Joanna Pipson. Um, yes, my name is Joanna Pipson. Can you hear me, please? Yes, please. yes we can hear you. We can hear you. Host. Joanna, we can hear you, please. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Right. Okay. So uh, my internet was misbehaving when I was introduced. So I didn't hear anything, but um, apologies for that. So um, as you've already heard, my name is Joanna Pipson. And I'll be taking you through how we can protect our intellectual property. So for the next one hour or so, um, we'll be going through the laws in Ghana that have to do with intellectual property and how they help us to protect those properties that um, we create. Right. Um, so in the next one hour or so, we'll be looking at what intellectual property is, So that at the end of the session, all of us will be able to explain to anyone who 
inquires of us what intellectual property refers to. We'll also be able to tell the basic means by which we can protect our intellectual property. We'll also look at how as individuals, as creators of intellectual property, how we can protect them by our own selves. So before we delve into um, what we are going to do today, I have a few of my colleagues um, online that I would want to introduce. Um, right, so we have um, lawyer Frances Jima. She's an associate with Gracias Law Consult in Accra. We also have lawyer Irama Damwadapa. She is a district court magistrate who is also in Accra. We also have um, lawyer Wisdom Anka. He is an associate with Ali Nachia and Co. I'm sure those of us in Ghana, we, we've heard about Ali Nachia and Co. Ali Nachia and Co is a, a law firm specialized in taxation. Yes. So these are a few of my colleagues who will be supporting us in between. Um, when, when they need be. So let's go straight into how we can protect our intellectual property. All right. So first of all, what is intellectual property? What is intellectual property? So intellectual property, as the name suggests, is any creation of the human mind any creation of the human mind. Um, the concept describes the protection afforded to persons who create things by their own originality. And so intellectual property rights are therefore ownership rights that a person has over things that are created as a result of his or her own original ideas, right? So this right conferred on creators of intellectual property Yeah, so the, the right conferred on creators of intellectual property actually denies other people of the free use of such, such protected material. And it is usually said that the nature of the creation or what you actually bring into being by your originality will determine the kind of protection the law will, will grant to you. Right, so intellectual property laws actually regulate the creation, use and exploitation of creations of the human mind. Hmm. And so if your creation has economic value or if anybody has, has brought something into being which has economic value, then you are at the right place because we are going to find out how we can protect these intellectual properties by our own selves aside the rights that the laws grant to persons who create intellectual property. But before we, we do that, we're going to look at a few theories that underpin um, what we know as intellectual property. So the first theory we'll look at is the natural rights theory. The natural rights theory, right? So what is the natural rights theory of intellectual property? So this theory, this theory says that intellectual property is actually the basic form of property as it is the creation of a person's mind. And for that matter, such a person must be given exclusive right to benefit from his own creations. So the main justification for this theory is that we all have rights to consider our ideas as a natural property by virtue of the fact that those ideas emanated from our own efforts and our own originality. In other words, an author has natural rights to his creation. 
So as we go on, we'll come to find out that the Ghanaian laws that govern intellectual property, um, such as the Copyright Act, the Patents Act, and the rest, they treat, they actually treat our intellectual property as natural rights. So when we get there, we'll, we'll delve into that. Um, just before I forget, um, this session is a very interactive one. So anybody who has a question to ask can raise their hands and the, the person will be allowed to ask a question or make a comment. So I, was, I am still on the natural rights theory. So the natural rights theory is saying that it is natural for everybody to create something out of their own originality. Huh. So if the person creates something, then it is for the state to give that person the protection they require so that the person can hold whatever they brought into being to their chest, you know, and feel proud of their own creations. So that is basically um, what the natural right theory says. Right. So the next theory we'll look at is the reward theory. The reward theory says that a person who creates a thing should be rewarded. Uh -huh. And the intellectual property rights here are viewed as an expression of acknowledgement and indebtedness to the author. So if we are saying that everybody should receive reward for what they do, then someone who uses his mind to create something should also be rewarded. And so what the state does in an effort to reward a creator of an intellectual property is to confer a right on that person, such that when that right is interfered with, then the state can come in and say that this person was protected. And so you, you could not have dealt in the manner that you, you dealt with the person's intellectual property. Uh -huh. So we've so far we've looked at two basic theories. We've looked at the natural right theory to intellectual property, and we've looked at the reward theory of intellectual property. Let's keep them in mind because we'll come back to it. Then there is also the incentive theory, which is almost similar to the reward theory. The incentive theory also says that creators of intellectual property deserve a reward for their creativity. This validates the duty of society to respect innovators and their right to ownership. Now this right conferred by law is therefore to propel the creator to do even more for the benefit of all and sundry. So there is also the theory that says that rights, these intellectual property rights are conferred on creators of intellectual property so that they will be propelled or incentivized to even do more of what they are doing. Uh -huh. Right. And so such rights are conferred on those people, I mean, on all of us, so that we'll be able to do even more, bring up inventions, write books, you know, do all manner of things that fall into the intellectual property space for the growth of society. All right, so we'll look at the final theory and then we'll take the, the ways that society or the laws protect our intellectual property one after the other and then we'll discuss. So the last theory underpinning intellectual property is the contract or disclosure theory. So the contract or disclosure theory says that when a creator makes his own work, makes his work available for the benefit of the society, there must be or there is a social contract between the creator and the society such that society will protect the interest of the owner in the work. This mainly has to do with patents. We've not discussed patents yet. So when we get there, we'll, uh, we'll explain further into that. But basically it is saying that 
So we can use the example of um, Japa. Uh, for those of us who are in Ghana, we know of Japa. Um, or maybe the Veronica buckets that we all started using during COVID. So those Veronica buckets, before COVID came, we had no idea of Veronica buckets. We knew that those buckets were used as um, storage, storage tanks for water and the others. But when COVID struck, people had to go beyond their normal, think outside the box to use those storage tanks to create things that helped us during COVID, especially when it comes to washing of hands. So this theory is saying that a person who invents something like that, when that thing comes into the public domain, such a person should be awarded or a right should be conferred on such a person such that the thing they have created will not be copied or will not be reproduced by someone else who will now claim ownership for what they have done. Right. So is there any question or we can move on? Are there any hands? Oh, we don't have any hands. Um, everyone can um, put their questions in the chat box as well if you think of any as the session goes forward. Hi, Joanna, we can move on, please. Oh, sorry. So apparently I was, I was not being hit. Right. So I was saying that, so where should I go back to the contract or disclosure theory, or we should continue from the, the basic ways to protect our intellectual property. So I think you ended. Hello. With... Hello, Joanna. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, please. So you ended with the contract and disclosure theory. So we can go from there, please. Can you come again? I can't hear you, please. Hello, can you hear me? Please, I was saying that um, you ended with the contract theory. So we can go from there.
Oh, okay. Right. All right. So I've unmuted now. So can we continue? Yes, please, we can. All right. So I was saying that there are four basic ways or four primary ways by which we can protect our intellectual property. The first one, we can use copyrights to protect our intellectual property. The second one is patents. The third one, trademarks, and then trade secrets. So as I mentioned earlier, the kind of thing you bring into being will determine the kind of protection that the law would confer on you or on the product you have brought into being. Yes, so these four are actually for different kinds of intellectual property. So as we continue, we would come to find out what actually qualifies to be copyrighted, what qualifies to be patented, you know, and what are trademarks. Then we'll come to find out what trade secrets also are, right? So now let's move into copyright. Uh -huh. So what, what, what is copyright? What is copyright? I indicated that I, I wanted, I mean, this session to be very lively so that it won't be that I'm the only one speaking. So um, can anyone help us? What is copyright? What, what do we know about copyright? What is copyright? Will anybody want to tell us? Anybody? Host, is someone's hand out? Up? <laughs> Hello. Yes, there's a hand up. Yes. I want to try about copyright. Hello? Please, can you hear me? Hi, we can hear you. Can we, can we go on, please? Okay. I'm in the person of Abdul Wahab Osman. And I think copyright is the, the right a user or the owner of the property has to do whatever he or she wants with whatever that person has brought forth. So let's see the right someone has to manipulate his or her idea, something like that. I don't know if my try is good enough. Yeah, Hi, Abdel, please, can you come again? Um, Joanna says she can't really hear you well. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, please. I, yeah, I said copyright is like yes. the right of an idea has over his or her idea to manipulate it to whichever way he or she likes. Yes, there's another hand up. Yes, please speak. I think copyright is an expensive right which kind of relates on the concept of a product. The concept of a product could be literature, physical, or accessible. So the expensive right is the best class to distribute those concepts of product, sell those concepts of product, or distribute those concepts of product. Right. right. So it is said that in an adult class, there's no wrong answer. So we are all right. Good. So copyright. When you go to the, if you look at the Copyright Act, the Copyright Act of 2005, Act 690, the act defines copyright as a right conferred on the owner of intellectual property, which gives the owner exclusive rights to copy, 
to distribute, to okay. adapt, to display, and to perform creative work. Mm. So copyright is defined by the Copyright Act 2005 at 690 as the right conferred on the owner of intellectual property, which gives the owner exclusive right to copy, to distribute, to adapt, to display, and to perform creative works. This right actually and inversely protects the economic right of the owner. And it is a way of securing economic advantage for the creator. I'm sure by now you will see where we are headed. So we'll come to work eligible for copyright. Work that is eligible for the right conferred on persons who create such intellectual property. So the Copyright Act actually lists a number of things that qualify or works that are eligible to be copyrighted. So the first one, if you look on the screen, you will see we have um, poems, computer programs, thesis, choreography, literary works, photographs, drawings, audiovisuals, as in videos, sound recordings, paintings, etc. So all these things qualify or they are eligible to be copyrighted. So anybody who has work like this, anybody who writes a thesis, whether it is published or not, you know, that person is, the, is a creator of intellectual property. Someone who puts together a beautiful poem also qualifies to be given the right that is accorded persons who create intellectual property. So all these things in this category qualify or are eligible for the right conferred on intellectual property creators which fall under this category, right? So um, mm -hmm. let's find out. If I have written a thesis, it's a question, oh, we right. said we want this session to be very interactive. I have written a, a thesis. Um, it hasn't been published, but maybe it's in my department's library and someone refers to my work, but the person does not acknowledge the fact that they took something from my thesis and incorporated in their work. Will that amount to a copyright infringement? Will that amount to a copyright infringement? I don't know if we got my question. I'm saying that I have written a thesis. Maybe I am, um, during my first degree, my, no, my research work that I did, mm -hmm. let's say something on gender, it's in my department library. But I'm reading someone's work and I've realized that something I discovered during my research has been cited in another person's book, but there was no reference to my work, which is the work that the person took this uh, piece from. We are asking that, would that qualify as a copyright infringement? Easy to just... Hello, Frances. Hello, Frances. Yes, please unmute and, and 
and speak. So I think earlier on said that copyright, the difference of copyright good as for anything that has been registered or not registered. So even though the the original creator of the TPL or the TPL registered it, once I've recited in another person's way, without registering the amount of copyright. Great. Great. Anybody else? Anybody else, please? All right. So thank you very much for your answer. That is that is true. So we'll come to find out. So let's keep this answer somewhere, whether that is a copyright infringement or not. But um, le please let's move to the next slide. Let's look at conditions for the recognition of a copyright. So I asked that first question on purpose, just to tease our minds. So let's look at conditions for the recognition of copyright. Right. So a work is not eligible for copyright unless one, it is original in character. Two, unless it has been fixed in a definite medium of expression. And three, it is created by a citizen or a person who is ordinarily resident in the Republic or it is first published in the Republic. And in the case of works that is first published outside the Republic is subsequently published here in Ghana within 30 days of its publication outside the Republic. So what this part is saying is that, what this part is saying is that to qualify, for any work to qualify as a copyrighted material, First of all, the work must be original. It must be something that no one has worked on before. It must be original. Uh -huh. And by original, I'm sure we understand. Original is something you have done by your own self. So if someone has written a thesis on gender, you can actually also do something on gender, but picking it from a different perspective. So when it happens like that, it can be said that your work is actually qualified or eligible to be copyrighted because your work is original, right? And the second thing is that it has to be fixed in a definite medium of expression. So the thesis example we used earlier, Iram's answer was actually right because under the Copyright Act, ideas, anything, anything that is created by a person, which is not put in a specific medium or a definite medium of expression does not qualify to be copyrighted. So after thesis, we all know what it is. Usually, you know, thesis, it is a, there is a definite medium of expression. And so it can, we can say that, I mean, that is why the Copyright Act recognizes thesis as a work or as work that qualifies to be copyrighted. Mm. So we all need to keep these things in mind. If you look at these things, it will help us to appreciate whether or not something we have brought into being by our own originality actually qualifies to be copyrighted. Uh -huh. And as already talked about, there are things that qualify to be copyrighted. Sometimes most of us confuse a lot of things. You Sometimes you hear a researcher who says that they want to go and patent uh, something they have written, you know. But as we, as we continue, we'll come to realize that, um, like I said earlier, the kind of thing you produce will determine 
what right will be conferred on it? So someone who brings a trademark, who takes a trademark to the Registrar General to be registered cannot go and say that he is coming to a patent, let's say patent the, the trademark, you know. So we, as we continue, we'll come to understand things even better. So we are saying that the three main conditions for the recognition of a copyright is that a work is not eligible if it is not original in character, if it has not been fixed in any definite medium of expression or that the person is not a citizen. And what the third part is saying is that even if you are not a citizen, if you have published your work outside Ghana, you should ensure that for the copyright laws to cover you, you would have within 30 days of the publication in another country come to also publish it here in Ghana. Then the copyright laws will cover you. Otherwise, you cannot be said to have any copyright, uh, copyright rights, <laughs> so to speak, in Ghana. All right. So let's move on. If there's, if there's no question, then we can move on to the next slide. And there are a few things we need to note. Right. So someone is asking what is meant by a definite medium of expression. Right. So please, let's just get done with this slide and then let's see if you would want you still want an answer to that or let's finish with this and then i'll give you an answer to that so these are a few things we need to note when it comes to copyright the first thing is that protection under Ghanaian copyright laws is automatic it's automatic whether you register your work or not the law confers the right on you so if you have written a book, the law automatically confers copyright on you so that no one should be able to copy your work and reproduce it in any manner that infringes upon your rights as the copyright holder. Huh. So the protection is automatic protection is automatic. Let's keep that in mind. The second thing we need to note is that ideas, concepts, procedures, methods, or other things of a similar nature are excluded from copyright protection. Ideas, concepts, procedures, methods, or other things of a similar nature are excluded from copyright protection. What this means is that if you have produced anything, in fact, let me, let me come again. So let's say Mr. A in Kumasi writes down in his notebook a very beautiful story which he intends to turn into a movie. So he's later going to get people to play that out in a movie. And Mr. B, also has the same story, but Mr. B goes ahead to employ actresses, actors and actresses, and he finally puts that into a movie. Mind you, it's the same idea or similar idea, but one person has brought it out into reality. What we are saying here is that the law will protect the one who has brought their idea into being by actually producing it into a movie. Uh -huh. So for, um, for our participants who is, yeah, Dunia, Dunia Jeremiah. Uh -huh. So to say that um, a, a, a specific medium, we are saying that your, what you are bringing into being should not just be an idea, but it should actually be a concept that um that should be that is tangible or something that should should be seen and felt uh -huh. so in the idea stage the law gives no protection the law gives no protection for ideas 
So if you have an idea, what the copyright law is saying is that if you want this automatic right conferred on you, put it into a certain medium where it can be seen or it can be felt. Mm -hmm. Then the third thing we need to note is that the rights of the author are protected during the life of that author and 70 years after the death of the author, of the author, yes. So the right conferred on a person who has material that qualifies as a copyrighted material is for 70 years, even after the person's death. And the beauty of our copyright law is that that right can actually devolve on, on your death. You can pass it on to another person, to your successor, someone who, who succeeds you after you have died. So during the life you enjoy, you, you have that right. And then even after you have died, the right will persist 70 years after you have died. Right. So the next thing we need to note is that where a work is jointly authored, the rights of the author are protected during the life of the last surviving author and 70 years after the death of that author. So we are saying that where two or more people create something, creates something which is in the like of an intellectual property, then even if you are five people or 10 people or 50 people, the law is saying that the right is conferred on each one of you during your life. And even af after the death of the last person, the right will still persist for 70 years. Uh -huh. I hope we understand it. Right. So the, our copyright laws are automatic. The right conferred on, on copyrighted material is automatic. You need not go and register before that right is conferred on you. But we'll come to find out later that you will still have to register anyway, but we'll find out why we we'll need to register if the, the, the right is conferred automatically. Uh -huh. But for now, we are looking at things that we need to note when it comes to copyright. So um, we have mentioned that the first one is that the right is automatic. The second one is that ideas, concepts, procedures are not protected under the copyright laws. And then the rights of the author is attached to their life in 70 years after they have, they have passed. And then we are saying that even where there are multiple authors, the same principle applies. The right is attached to your life. And after you have died 70 years, the right will still be conferred on you. The next thing we need to note is that, I mean, I mentioned this. So I was saying that if we did not have to register because the right was automatic, I mean, if the right conferred on copyrighted material is automatic, then we need not register, isn't it? Will, will, will that not be the, the logical conclusion anybody will come to? Uh -huh. So why do we then need to register? If you look at the, the law in its totality, in fact, the law says that the purpose of registration are as follows, as you are seeing on the screen. First of all, it is to maintain the records. Secondly, it is to publicize the rights of the owners. And third, it is to give evidence of the ownership and authentication of intellectual property. So you would realize that this registration under the Copyright Act mainly has to do with evidence. Uh -huh. So the law is saying that you are protected whether or not you, you register, but it is still saying that you would need to register for the sake of the records 
so that in the event that someone infringes on your rights and you proceed to court, then you would have evidence from Registrar General's department to show that I actually originated this work and I got it registered afterwards. So this is my evidence. If that other person who claims the work also belongs to them also has evidence from Registrar General's department, they can bring it so that the court will, will determine who actually is the right holder. Uh -huh. And so registration under a copyright act is basically for evidence and evidential purposes. Uh -huh. Right. Does the definite medium of expression include social media? Well, um, the law doesn't mention social media, but I am thinking that social media will also be um, a way of publishing, publishing anything. So in the event that someone infringes on your rights, so let's say you publish something um, uh, on, on your social media handle and another person copies it, you know, then we can say that because it, it got published, because social media, there are so many people on social media. Uh -huh. And there are people who will be willing to testify that the first time they saw any work on that was from you. Mm -hmm. So now it will come down to probably your word against that person's word. And we are saying that ideas are not protected. So if it is a book that got published and you, you also posted it on your social media platforms, then we can say that it has moved from the idea stage to something that we can actually see or feel. Uh -huh. Right, so are you clear, please? All right, so let's move on then. Okay, so we have seen that persons who are conferred with copyright or persons who have copyrighted material. There are things that the law allows us to do and there are things that the law does not allow us to do. So first of all, any copyrighted material before you can copy, before you can publish or deal with it in any manner, you would have to get the consent of the owner of the rights before you are able to deal with it in a manner that is contrary to that of the owner. Uh -huh. But we need to also note that the law allows a certain level of use when it comes to copyrighted material. The first thing is personal use. Uh -huh. So I can go to a library and pick someone's book, let's say Shakespeare, and read it. That is not a copyright infringement. Although I did not use my money to buy it, that is not a copyright infringement uh -huh, because it is for my personal use. I am not copying it to go and sell to anybody. You know, I am not looking at the story to go and play it out as a movie. So it does not qualify as a copyright infringement. Uh -huh. The second thing we need to note is that the law permits the use of copyrighted material in research work. Uh -huh. But the caveat is that if you are using another person's work in your research work, as we all know, you would need to acknowledge the person by referencing. Uh -huh. You need to acknowledge the person by giving them a reference. And then another permitted use of copyrighted work is that it can, any copyrighted work can be used for teaching purposes. Uh -huh. So if I am a teacher and I have students who cannot afford to buy Shakespeare's book, I can buy a copy and come and read it to my students. And my students can take notes, go and study. They can even share with their friends. That is not a copyright infringement. Uh -huh. So you cannot take on that teacher whose students cannot buy those books and say that he infringed on your, uh, uh, on your copyrights. Uh -huh. So 
these are the three main permitted use of copyrighted work. All right, so now let's find out. We are saying that the law actually protects our copyrighted material or our copyrighted work, and it is automatic. And we said that we need not register to get that right conferred on us, right? So if we need not register to get that right conferred on us, and we already have that right coming to us automatically, is it important for us to find ways of protecting our work even by our own selves? The answer is yes. Because for those um, of us in academia, we would realize that sometimes you, you, you do your work, show it to your friend, and before you realize, your friend will get the approval to, <laughs> to even work on your topic you know, just before you even get to your supervisor. So it is important that we by our own selves protect our work. So let's find out how we can protect our work, our copyrighted work, right? So for thesis and literary works like books, novels and the rest, the law encourages us that we should document our discoveries. The second one is also that we would have to save our documents or present our documents in the read-only formats, PDFs and the rest, such that if you share your work with anybody, it will be difficult for the person to edit it and put it out in a way that will infringe on your rights. You know, we, we have already said that um, copyright is the basic form of uh, ownership of property. So even if, you have nothing at all, nothing material in this world, but you've been able to write a thesis. You should know that you're a property owner. Uh -huh. And it is a very important one. So we are saying that, first of all, ensure that you document your discoveries so that in the event that, in the event that anything comes up, which is an infringement on your copyright, then you can go back to your basics you know, the discoveries you made when you went onto the field to collect your data to show to the court that, my Lord, this, I went here, I went here, this is what I found. And this is what, uh, you know, brought me to this conclusion or brought me to the, the, the final work that I have. So if the other person who is infringing on your rights also has anything to support the fact that their work actually belongs to them, then they can also bring it out so that the court will determine who is actually the copyright owner. Right, so the third one is that we could also use watermarks. I'm sure we all know watermarks. Watermarks are sometimes, it could be your name. So you may have a document in um, Word or whichever form, but they can still have your name such that anywhere that document goes to, your name is on it. And edit editing is usually a problem. And so you protect your own work by your own self, even though we are saying that the copyright laws give automatic protection, right? So the next one we'll look at is that you can also limit the number of times a user can access your work. That is another kind of protection you can give to your own self. Then you can also get your work published. So once your work is published, then you know that a number of people would have seen it. So copying your work will actually be a bit problematic. And it is only uh, criminals who can go ahead to copy your work without uh, acknowledging the fact that you brought that work into being. Uh -huh. All right, so um, when it comes to sound recordings, music, performances, and the rest, how can we protect those kind of works by our own selves? How can we protect that kind of work by our own selves? So the first thing we can do is that, the first thing we can do is that 
we can upload them onto appropriate platforms where we are assured of our economic benefits. We can upload them onto platforms where we are assured of our economic benefits. So you will see that for movies, you know, movies and the rest, there's Netflix. And there are other paid platforms where you are assured that when you, you give them your work, returns, your, your economic benefits are assured. Mm. Then when it comes to music, we have Spotify, we have Apple Music, we have Audio Mac. We can upload our, our music onto those platforms. And we, I mean, there are several others, but um, I just, just these three, it's okay for, for our purposes. So we need to ensure that we are uploading our movies and music onto appropriate platforms where we are assured of our economic benefits. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, this is the end of our lecture on intellectual property, especially um, copyright. So if there's no question, we can move on to patents. Is it? Yeah, we can move on to patent. Post, please, can I go ahead? Yes, please, you can go ahead. If there are no questions, if there are no questions, then we'll move on to the next slide. But as a recap, as a recap, we have said that copyright is the right conferred on a person who brings into being a literary work, an artistic work, a musical work, audiovisual, choreographic work, um, computer software or programs and the like. We also said that um, for any work to be eligible for copyright, that work must be original and it must be fixed in a definite medium of expression. Then we also said that you need not register your work before the right is conferred on you. And that the copyright law says that the right is automatic once you bring something into being from your intellect. Then the next thing we said was that even though we need not register to get that right conferred on us, we, it would be in our own interest to register our works for the sake of evidence so that in the near future, if you have, if you have any competing interest, then you take it to court and the court will look at that evidence and determine whether or not the, the, the right is conferred on you or is conferred on another person, right? So let's move on to patents. So what are patents? What are patents? For patents, the main law that governs patents is the Patent Act of 2003, Act 657. And that act defines patent as the title granted to protect an invention. The title granted to protect an invention. Uh -huh. So you would realize that um, patents are for inventions. So what are inventions? An invention simply means the expression of an idea which provides solution to a specific problem. Mm. So patents protect inventions. And the key to patenting anything is that the thing must be an absolute novelty. The thing must be an absolute novelty. It must be new. There should have been none of its kind before it's coming into being. So this simply means that you cannot patent something that is already in existence. All right. So please let's move to the next slide. 
So these, there are a few things we need to note when it comes to patents. The first thing is that the right to a patent belongs to the inventor. The right to a patent belongs to the inventor. And the second one is that where two or more persons have jointly made an invention, the right to the patent belongs to both of them. Mm. Where two or more persons have jointly made an invention, the right to the patent belongs to them jointly. Right. So what it means is that, I mean, both of you are considered as the, the owners. Uh -huh. Right. Then the third thing we need to note is that where two or more persons have made the same invention independently of each other, the person whose application has the earliest filing date shall have the right to the patent as long as the application is not withdrawn, abandoned, or rejected. So what we are saying here is that two people may have created the same thing. So we can talk, those of us in Ghana, we can talk of the Veronica buckets. Very soon we'll see them in pictures. We can talk of the Veronica buckets. I mean, after that one, anybody at all can, can relate. So maybe during COVID, somebody also had that idea and the person was trying to put it together. But just before they realized, one person had taken it to the Registrar General's department that, oh, I've brought something new. I, I created this by my own self. And the thing gets patented, you know. That is what this part is saying, that where two or more persons have the same invention or have created the same thing, the person who will be granted the patent is the person who first files for the patent. Uh -huh. So first and first thing, that is what this part is saying that if you have an idea and you have put it together, you have to be quick enough to go and get the patent. Otherwise, someone who has the same idea, who has brought it into being, into a specific medium, will get it registered and you will not have the patent. Uh -huh. Mind you, we said patents are rights granted to inventors. And by invention, we are saying that something that is not in existence. So once, someone registered it, then that's all. It means the subsequent interest cannot be registered. Uh -huh. All right. So the next thing we need to note is that the right to a patent may be assigned, it may be transferred, and it may devolve by succession. So this right, just like copyright, can also be, you can actually put it in your will that um, this right conferred on me, this patent, I am transferring it when I'm, when I'm, I'm not alive, that right should be conferred on me, Mr. B, maybe my husband or my son or this. Uh -huh. it, can, it can actually be willed, right? Okay. Then the next thing we need to note is that where an invention is made in execution of an employment contract, the right to the patent belongs in the absence of any contractual provisions to the contrary to the employer. Let's listen to this carefully because this matter comes up very often. This part is saying that where an invention is made in execution of an employment contract, the right to the patent belongs to the employer in the absence of any contractual provision to the contrary. So what this provision is saying is that if you are if you are employed by Mr. A to, let's say, create, um, uh, what do we say? Okay, so let's use wedding invitation. To, to, you are a graphic designer and two people intending to get married come to you to create a, an invitation card, card for them. You create the invitation card plus banners and other things. In, in that instance, who does the intellectual property belong to? So these matters come up 
very often. I have a friend who has a business who said she contracted a graphic designer for the graphic designer to create a logo for her business. Subsequently, the graphic designer was claiming the intellectual property. Although this friend of mine paid that graphic graphic designer to do that work for her. What this part is saying is that where you are a creative and you are paid to do intellectual work, you are paid to do anything that has to do with intellectual property. The law says that the work belongs to the person who paid you, although it is your intellectual property. So it means that the person paid you to also give back something to her or him. And so you cannot go and come back and say that the intellectual property belongs to you. And for that matter, that thing you created also belongs to you. I hope we are getting the picture. Uh -huh. So if you contract someone to create a logo for your business or to create, um, let's say, your, your trademark, and you pay the person, the person cannot, by law, say that that intellectual property belongs to him. The law says that under that circumstance, that particular thing belongs to the employer in the absence of any contract. Uh -huh. So please, let's keep that in mind. The next thing we need to note is that where the invention has an economic value much greater than the parties could have reasonably foreseen, at the time of the conclusion of the contract, the inventor shall be entitled to a special remuneration, which shall be fixed by the court in the absence of an agreement between the parties. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on. Okay. So the inventor shall be named as the inventor in the patent, unless in a special written declarations signed by the inventor and addressed to the registrar, the inventor indicates a desire not to be named. So there are so many um, people who take their inventions to the registrar general's department to be registered. Under normal circumstances, your name must be in the patent. But there are people who usually create things, but do not want their names to be associated with them. Uh -huh. So that is what the law is talking about. That in the absence of, in the absence of anything like that, your name must be there. <laughs> your name must be there. Otherwise, if you do not desire that your name be put on the patent, you have to indicate it clearly. All right. So um, let's move on, please. OK, there's a question. What about a creation developed during enrollment in the university? Creation, can, can, you, can you come a, a bit clear? I don't, I don't seem to understand you. Creation developed during enrollment in the university. Can you come a bit clear, please? Um, Anne. Yes, um, sorry, I just took my, my microphone off so I could ask the question clearly. So I was asking about if the creation, let's say you are enrolled in university and then maybe during your like your lab session or during um, allocated periods for creating labs, you, you invent something. And let's say that lab is funded by the university or from um, like a funding source related to the university, um, but it's not something you're employed to do. You're enrolled in the university as a student. Whatever you create, will that be considered um, the university's property? Or is that something that you can claim as your intellectual property? So, and right. the second question to that is, the part two of that question is, does that does it have to, does it only apply to if you were employed as an employee? Is that when it would that you know um, that little um, point will will uh, come into play? 
Is it only, is the employment factor what constitutes it belonging, you know, to the, um, the party that is, um, that has right. a stake in what it is you're inventing, yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right. Um, so what it is is that if you're a university student, usually um, a, a student in a university is seen as an independent person. So if you're able to create something by yourself during your university education, then if, if it is something that is patentable, then the patent will belong to you. But when it comes to anything that you receive money for the exchange of your intellectual property, the Ghanaian laws say that that thing you create for the person who paid you belongs to that person and not you. Although it is your intellectual property. Hmm. Is it clear, please? So what you yeah, so just to verify, I'm just gonna repeat that back to you. So what you're saying is that if the person, whether they employ you or whether maybe it's a contract to get you to create that invention, it belongs to them because of course they are paying you to create that. But what you're saying is with regard to the university or um whatever uh, body, if you are not either by contract or outsourced or paid for that invention, then it belongs to the, in the person who's con considered independent, whether it's a university or- Thank you very you. much. You're a very good student. Okay, that's what you're saying. I wish I could Thank see you. your face. <laughs> oh, so that's just it. That's just it. All right. So um, let's now look at inventions that are patentable. Inventions that are patentable. Inventions that are patentable. So the first one is that an invention is patentable if it is new, if it involves an inventive step and is industrially applicable. So I'll go back to my Japa example. Um, I mean, my Veronica Bucket example. So let's run it through the facts and see if it qualifies. So before, yes, I have a COVID, question. was there anything like Veronica Bucket? We were not we're using not In fact, we we're not using that term. What we knew is that Veronica is a person's name. We didn't even know we could have a, a, a bucket called Veronica. You know, during those times when I heard Veronica buckets, I was just imagining how those who were called Veronica would feel. I, I felt really sorry for them, but um, it was an invention that somebody decided to name Veronica buckets. Interestingly, it was an invention because it was new, because it involved an inventive step, and it was industrially applicable. We needed things to help us wash our hands without touching them. So around that time, our taps were not the best to be used for washing hands. So someone sat down, thought carefully, and brought up that invention. And so we had something to wash our hands with, which was out of the ordinary. Uh -huh. So we're saying that for something to be patentable, for you to be conferred with the right of a patent, your invention must be new, it must involve an inventive step, and it must be industrially applicable. Uh, and we know that an invention is, a, is new if it is not anticipated by a prior act. So basically, before that thing comes into being, there should have been nothing of its sort. That is basically what we are saying. Okay, so what are the things that are excluded from patent protection? Are discoveries, scientific theories, and mathematical methods do they qualify as patentable, patentable things? The next slide, please. Patentable things. So, discoveries, scientific theories, and mathematical theories, schemes, rules, or methods for doing business, performing purely mental acts or playing games, and methods for treatment of the human body, or animal body by surgery or therapy, as well as 
diagnostic methods practiced on the human body or animal body do not qualify as patentable products. They do not qualify as patentable products. Okay, so there's a question. Can a graphic designer or an innovator publish their creation which they were paid for in their portfolio for public presentation purposes? <laughs> Can a graphic designer or an innovator publish their creation which they which they were paid for. Um, I would want to hear you on this. What do you think? I think you have the answer. <laughs> so let, let share it with us. What do you think? Yeah, I think... Um, Kweku Okran, please share it yes. with us. I think you have the answer. The answer is in the question. So can you share, share your opinion with us? What do you think? I think since it's a public presentation, it shouldn't be that way because it's already been paid for. Uh -huh. You see, so, so you, you, you got the answer. But, you got the um, answer, that's right. So but sometimes once we need you to... have been paid for, yeah, present... what the Ghanaian law is saying is that it does not belong to you. So it is for the person who paid for that thing to publish it and not the one who created the intellectual property because they paid you for it. Mm -hmm. That's basically what we are saying. All right. So this brings us um, actually hello, to the um, end of- Hello. Um, wanna... Hello. Um, uh, um, this brings us to the end of our patent lecture. Hi, Joanna. Our patent section. So in the absence of any further question, or if there are further questions, we can have them. But in the absence of any further question, we would want to move on to trademarks. To I trademarks. Don't, I think there's a question here. We want to be between time. I mean, we want to be on time. We don't want to go beyond the time allocated to us. So can we move on? Host. I think there's a question here, please. Please say again. Well, Kwokran was trying to ask a question. I don't know. All right. Yes, yes, All right. yes. Um, right. I was trying to. I was trying to say that um, if there are some public presentations. You do that because you are applying for um, a contract or um, or something like something related to a contract, uh -huh. and you need to show what you've done. Um, you get my point. All right, so let's move on to trademarks. Remember we said we are going to look at four basic ways to protect our intellectual property. And so far we've looked at copyright, we've looked at patents, and what qualifies to be patented. Now we are going to trademarks. So what are trademarks? Trademark um is governed by the trademarks act 2004 act 664 uh, the law that governs trademarks is the trademarks act 2004 act 664 that law defines a trademark as a sign or a combination of signs capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one organization from the other. These are usually symbols and logos, words, phrases that identify an organization or a product. These trademarks must be such that they create no confusion in the minds of the public. Any purpose confusion will be declined registration. And the thing is that the laws of Ghana require that trademarks be distinct and easily identifiable. Okay. So what this means is that 
we will not be able to register our trademarks in Ghana if it is similar to a, a, known, a known trademark, be it in Ghana or anywhere else. Uh -huh. So like we said earlier, it has to be distinct it, and it must easily identify a product or an organization. Uh -huh. Host, I saw you putting um, examples of trademarks on. Can we have it? Yes. So these are examples of trademarks. And I'm sure some of us can just look at it and tell us all these organizations. Uh -huh. So we are seeing Nike. We are seeing um, um, trademarks from Ghana TV3. We are seeing, we're seeing Coca-Cola. We are seeing NS Chemist. We are seeing Apple. We're seeing Samsung. We're seeing McDonald's. Uh -huh. These are all trademarks. These are all trademarks. And like we said, trademarks are usually signs, symbols, a combination of characters and all that. Okay. So um, there are a few things we need to note when it comes to trademarks. Uh -huh. So please, let's move on to the next slide. Yes, things we need to note when it comes to trademarks. So the first thing is that the registration of a trademark is for a period of 10 years. Very important. In Ghana, if you register, if you register a trademark, the registration is for a period of 10 years from the filing date. Yes, which inversely means that at the end of the 10 years, you would have to re-register your trademark. And we need to also note that failure to re-register after the 10 years will mean that someone else can take on your, your trademark if you are not fortunate. But if you are fortunate and the eyes following you are very few, and then your, your, tra your trademark can be hanging in there while you, you, you prepare to go and re-register. But under the laws of Ghana, once you have registered a trademark, the registration lasts for a period of 10 years. And after that 10 years, you would have to re-register for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's something we need to note. Okay, so once someone has registered their, their um, trademark, what right is conferred on that person? So the right conferred on the person is that registration of a trademark by a person confers exclusive rights on that person to use the trademark. So you would realize that the trademarks, the example of trademarks we showed on the, on the screen, you would notice that apart from McDonald's, nobody else or no company in the world, no company in the world at all can use that uh, that trademark. When it comes to Nike, the same applies to Nike. So you realize that those of us who like wearing um, boots, you would realize that for most of the Chinese companies who would want to, apologies to any Chinese on this platform, but you would realize that any company who would want to imitate the Nike products, most often do not use the same trademark. You may see something that looks like it, but it is not actually what Nike original uses. Uh -huh. So the th what it is is that once you have registered it, it gives you the sole right to use that trademark to the exclusion of all others. Uh -huh. To the exclusion of all others. So under Ghanaian laws, you cannot even use a trademark that is similar to that of another person. The law does not want anybody to get confused when it comes to a product or an organization. Once you see a logo, you should know that this is coming from this company. That is what the law actually requires. And that is what it ensures that we have. So. Once you register, the law confers exclusive right to use that trademark 
on you. Okay. The next thing we need to note is that dealing in any way that is that is contrary to the right holder of a trademark, that person has remedies in law. And the first remedy is that the person can sue you in court. Uh -huh. And what we need to note is that if you do not want to get yourself into trouble, then you need to seek the consent of the holder of the, that right. So you need to get their permission to perform whatever act you want to do with their trademark. Otherwise, you get yourself into a suit that may last for a very long time. And even apart from the time you would waste going to court, you would also expend your finances, which will not help anybody. So under normal circumstances, you have to seek the person's permission if you want to use anybody's trademark just to avoid any problems that will come in the future. Right, the next thing is that the right of the registered owner extends to the use of a sign, which is similar to the registered trademark. So you would realize that there are some companies that have more than one trademark, but immediately you see it, you know that, oh, this is from Apple. You know that, oh, this is from Nike. You know that this is from um, McDonald's or this is from here. So you would have companies that have several, about two or three trademarks, but in reality, it does not create confusion to it for anybody. We all know that immediately you see it, you know that this is from Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. So that is what this part is talking about. And then we're saying that, the next point is saying that where there is use of an identical sign, for identical goods or services, a likelihood of confusion shall be presumed. So we are saying that for this part, number three, it is not talking about the same organization using different trademarks. It is talking about another organization trying to use a similar trademark in an effort to pass off on the main organization. So um, we can talk of, um, let's say Apple. So someone, another organization knowing that, no, no let's not, let's, let's, let's drop the Apple example. Let's use Nike. So you would find that a company would decide to also make boots like Nike does, but will write N-I-K instead of the normal N-I-K-E. Uh -huh. What the Ghanaian law is saying is that anything in that manner is unacceptable because the law will presume a likelihood of confusion. And that is what we don't want. We do not want to create confusion with anybody so that one person will benefit at the detriment of the other. Uh -huh. So if you want a trademark, it must be distinct. It must be clear. It must obviously point to one organization or one product. That is basically what this, this part is saying. Right, then um, let's move on to refusal to register a trademark. So in Ghana, the registrar can refuse to register a trademark that is brought before it for registration. In Ghana, Yes, refusal to register a trademark. Refusal to register a trademark. By saying that in Ghana, the registrar can refuse to register a trademark for the following reasons. One, if it is a trade name, the registrar will not register it. Mind you, we are talking about trademarks, 
not trade names. So we can have the example of this Ghanaian pharmaceutical company, NS Chemist. So NS Chemist cannot go to Registrar General's Department, cannot go to Registrar General's Department to say that um, the company is coming to register NS Chemist Limited as a trademark. Mind you, when we are dealing with trademarks, we are talking about signs, symbols, you know, marks, not trade names. So at the registration of the company level, the registrar general will take the company's name. And usually it is in the forms that you fail to register a company that you would have to provide the name of the company you are seeking to, 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 to bring into being. So the first thing is that if it is a trade name, the registrar will refuse to register it. The second thing is that if it is incapable of distinguishing the goods or services of one enterprise from the goods of the other, the registrar will not register it. Remember, we do not want to create confusion with anybody. We want our trademarks to be distinct and to clearly show that it belongs to company A or company B. So in the event that your trademark is likely to create confusion, the Registrar General in Ghana will refuse to register your trademark. And then the third one we need to note is that if it is contrary to public order or public morality, the Registrar will not register your trademark. So um, for public order, we all understand it. But when it comes to public morality, I'm sure we all understand it. I don't want to bring any example that will, <laughs> that will um, create any confusion with anybody. But what this part is saying is that we do not want anything that will, you know, bring up conversations, inappropriate conversations. So if your trademark is in the likelihood of anything of this nature, remember that the Registrar General will not register your trademark. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. The next thing is that if your trademark is likely to mislead the public or trade circles with particular reference to the ge geographical origin of the goods or service, oh my goodness, then the registrar will not register that. Right. If it is also identical to that of another company or another product, the registrar will not register that. Okay. So I would want to immediately move to um, trade secrets because I have a situation, <laughs> a little minor situation here. Trade secrets is just very short so that um, we, we can end the session. So trade secrets refers to organizational information that is confidential and which constitutes a central part of an organization or a business. Uh, these are usually secrets that the organization holds to their chest to protect their economic interest. So trade secrets, usually are things, information we do not want to share, very confidential information that we do not want to share with anybody because immediately it gets to the public domain, we may lose out on our economic benefits. Uh -huh. So most often these are things that make a, an organization a special one out of its competitors, right? So what we need to note about trade secrets is that they are, pro they are not protected officially by any law by way of registration. The reason is that we do not even want to share it with anybody. So we protect it by our own selves. Uh -huh. So um, let's look at how we can protect our own trade, trade secrets by our own selves. So the first thing is that we need to adapt very strong non-disclosure agreements policies. So if you have an organization, um, okay, we would realize that um, the bottled water companies all over the world, their water tastes different. 
And what makes their product taste different is their secret. Usually they will not want to share it with anybody. But mind you, they work with people. There are people who work on those plants to get the final product of the water that tastes a certain way. So how do we get those people to not take our confidential information out? The law is that you would have to adopt a very strong non-disclosure agreement policy. So before you employ the people, you get them to sign a non-disclosure agreement where they contract with the company that although I am coming into contact with all these confidential informations about your company, I am not in any way going to share it with any other person whether I keep working with you or I resign from, from, this, from the company. The second thing is that we can establish physical and electronic security and confidentiality measures. So you may have a room where <laughs> just those people will enter, you know, so that not everybody in the organization would have access to that kind of um, information. The next thing we can talk about is that we can put in place a team for information protection. So if you have put your recipe on, on paper, then you can get a team that is in charge of information protection so that not everybody at all in the organization can have access to that kind of confidential information. The next one is that we can also establish stringent due diligence procedures. They also help in um, keeping our trade secrets. Then we can also make trade secrets our priority. So if trade secrets is your priority, you ensure that whatever you do keeps your confidential information that brings you economic benefit to yourself. And it, it, so that it can, it will not go out to unauthorized persons. Uh -huh. So um, this is the end of our lecture. As you can see on the screen, we can, we can now ask questions. Okay, but I, I can't hear. Uh -huh. So we can put our questions, we can type them so that I'll respond to them. Yes, any question, please. Right, so trade secrets, as we've all, we already mentioned, they are things we do not want to share, but we need to also take into consideration the fact that we work, every organization works with people. And so you cannot say that you are keeping all that information to yourself. How would you do your work? How would you do your work? So most often when we talk about trade secrets, Usually Coca-Cola comes to mind. There are stories that only two people know the Coca-Cola, um, what makes Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. And that those two people do not even travel on the same uh, flight. Uh -huh. I don't know how true that is, but what it is is that we can limit the number of people in whose hands our trade secrets 
fall. So that in our effort to protect our own secrets, we do not get it out there because it is with so many people. Mm -hmm. So I agree with um, Madam Evelyn that we should not get it into the hands of as many people as we can. So for trade secrets, we can have just a few people. We can use our own discretion to determine the number of people who would want to have our secrets. Uh -huh. Again, um, so in a company like, in a company like, um, forgive me, I'm using Ghanaian companies, but in a company like Casa Preco, their drinks taste different from all the drinks we know in Ghana. So if we are talking about trade secrets for Casa Preco, let's say for their um, apple juice, what the organization can do is that it can put the secrets in the hands of its managers so that they share with individual um, team leaders who will direct their teams into bringing up those products uh -huh. so that our trade secrets will not be out there for everybody to have access to. Uh -huh. All right. So I'll respond. Um, apologies for the network interruption. Yes. So the next question is that um, <laughs> is there a regional or sub-regional regulatory body that regulates the trademark ownership or is it only at national levels? Um, for now, what I know is that it is just at the national level and it is the Registrar General's Department. It is the Registrar, the Registrar at the Registrar General's Department who is in charge of that. Uh -huh. Right, any other question, please? All right, so if there's no question, we'll say thank you very much to Joanne <laughs> for this insightful <laughs> session. Can you write? Yeah. So there's another question here. Mm -hmm. It says, can you write a contract that says that I, the creator, will still own the patent, but the client has rights for a period of time? Why not? So the provision we read in the Patents Act says that in the absence of any contract, to the contrary. Uh -huh. So once, once there is a contract between you and the other person, then why not? You can go ahead. Uh -huh. But in the absence of that contract, in the absence of that contract, that, that particular thing you bring into being belongs to the person who employed you to do it. Right. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so, so in the absence of any further questions, I'll bring my, my lecture to a closure and hand over to my host. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you so, so much. So at this point, we'll just like to take a, a screenshot so I would like for us to turn on our videos shortly. While Fafa takes a screenshot of us.
Yeah. Rafael, over to you, please. Hello, Fafa, can you hear me? Hello, Fafa. All right, thank you so much for your time. So the next session is going to be on, on Monday, the first, and the details of, of that session will come out tomorrow. Thank you so much for your time and see you. Thank you.